All right, so uh, last talk of the day, we have uh, Marco with us uh, from Canonical, and he will be talking about service orchestration in the cloud with uh, Juju. Um, I'll uh, let him uh, explain to you how that all works. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Marco Ceppi. I work for Canonical, but I started out originally as an Ubuntu community member and worked my way in. Um, I'm going to be talking about service orchestration in the cloud with Juju. Not quite configuration management, but still kind of exists in that realm. It's, it's what I like to think is maybe possibly the next step after you figured out how to configure your machines. Um, so this is again who I am. Um, welcome everyone, thank you. It's very late in the evening. I know we're all ready to go hit a pub or something, but stick with me and I'll show you more about Juju. Uh, so really, we think of things as the evolution of computing. And so we've gone from, as this image represents, bare metal. We've had racks of data centers since the early 80s. And everyone's been running their work on the top of that. Then we had virtualization. So let's take this bare metal, let's break it down. Let's make it even faster, better, um, optimized for container workloads. Then we have this thing called cloud computing, which is really just ephemeral virtualization at the end of the day. So that came along, we've evolved. Then we decided we have all these computers running, let's make it so we can easily, repeatably set up these environments. And then we have configuration management as a result of that. And we have a lot of great tools that do that today, and I'm sure you guys have heard talks from them earlier. So the next step of the evolution graph is service orchestration. So we have these machines, we have them all setting up, but now how do we get these machines to talk to each other? How do we get these services that we're deploying, that we're setting up and standing up with configuration management, how do we have them communicate with each other? And nearly automate our deployment. And then eventually, of course, we will hit this inevitable Skynet where everything talks to itself outside of human reach and decides that we are obsolete and kills us. So we are simply the next step to that ultimate goal. Uh, so what is Juju? I pretty much covered it, but we're not configuration management. We're service orchestration. We care about services. We don't care about machines. That's something that configuration management does exceptionally well. So I'm going to show you some stuff. This is an example of a deployment. Let's say, so you bootstrap. You say, hey, let's set up an environment. You deploy MediaWiki, deploy MySQL, deploy HAProxy. You're just deploying services. You didn't really tell where these machines are going. You don't really tell how these machines are stood up. You just want these services running. Then you tell these services to talk to each other. Well, MediaWiki needs to talk to MySQL, and MediaWiki needs to talk to HAProxy. And now we expose HAProxy to the outside world. And then we can now scale MediaWiki. This is just a set of series of instructions, for instance. Um, what we've done is we've modeled how we want our service to look, how we want our environment, our deployment, our topology to look in terms of services, not run these scripts on these machines and then send these configuration values back and forth. So here's an alternative example. So this is essentially very similar to what I just said. We have MySQL, we have MediaWiki, and we have HAProxy, and we have these lines between them. We have a service topology, essentially, what you would normally see in any kind of a data center. Let me go back to my slides. That was the GUI, by the way. So Juju is going to go ahead and say it's pretty awesome, a little biased, but I'm sure by the end of this talk, you'll at least be a little more interested in it. So, we're, we're doing things like we're taking services and deploying them and we're doing everything we need to accept that service. So in a lot of sense, it's apt-get for the cloud. apt-get installs the packages and configuration files with same defaults. Um, we're doing the same thing, but we're taking potentially multitude of packages and wrapping them into one service, a definition of a service. And we're doing this in a way that's easily repeatable across multiple clouds. Um, so these charms are doing everything for you. They're doing all the heavy lifting. You don't longer have to really <laughs> worry about what it is because some expert has decided that this is the best way to set up MediaWiki. Um, I'll talk about these last two bits in a second. It's not too important. But anyways, at the end of the day, the tools you're using are not that exciting. You want to leverage the expertise. So you don't want to go and have to go and figure out and read the entire book. You want someone to take that book and condense it into a script that you can run for let's say how to do Hadoop at high scale in the right way. You want just a script that you can run and repeat over and over again. So how we do this is with something called charms. So much like the name Juju, charms are actually these service definitions. They're, they're the instruction encapsulation of how do I set up a service? How does this service live in the world? So with a charm, you could do anything you like. Um, basically imagine root run this script. That is essentially, in a very 20 million foot view, that's what a charm is. Um, 
Charms can be written to do anything that you like and automate any way you want. What a charm really is, is the encapsulation of a life cycle of a service. How do I install a service? How do I change the configuration for a service? How do I start and stop it? What happens when these new relations are created with me? How do I receive data from other services? Charms just contain a bunch of scripts that model around those events. So you script these certain events within a life cycle, then those events are now repeatable across the distribution of that service in a deployment. So it's all the heavy lifting. The experts said, here's how you do this. Here's how you take a service, say MediaWiki, and here's how you configure it to talk to a database. And here's how you configure it to talk to HA proxy. And so now when you scale this service out to multiple units, they all know the same set of instructions on how to talk to HA proxy, how to talk to MySQL. Um, I did lie a bit though. So I said that Juju doesn't really care about configuration management, it's the next step above it. Um, we actually really do care about configuration management because in order to get to service orchestration, you have to do a certain set of configuration management. You have to set up these machines to run in order for Juju to run its service orchestration on top of that. So the way we've attacked this problem is from the top down rather than the bottom up. So if you think of the evolution of the, the service orchestration, you have virtualization and configuration management. We started with service orchestration. How do you get these units and services to speak to each other within an environment? Then we left the rest to you. So charms can be written in any language and to an extent they will be doing configuration management. As a result, you could write your charm in Bash, Python, Ruby, if you really like to in PHP with Shell. You can also leverage things like Chef and Puppet and Salt and Ansible to drive the deep level configuration of that one machine and then let Juju do the orchestration with all the other services that it cares about. So that's how we've avoided the problem of saying, Let's reinvent the wheel. Well, no, we have a hundred, well, maybe not a hundred, but we have tons of services and projects that are already solving this problem of how do you set up a machine. We want to do the next bit. We want to do your service orchestration. We want to make it so that your machines can talk to each other in a way that you don't need to bother. That, to an extent, is pretty much what I just said. I just missed that slide. My apologies. So again, we're leveraging community experts. We went to the person who packages MySQL for Debian, and we said, well, how would you set up MySQL in these various different scenarios? How would you do MySQL in HA? How would you do MySQL with a slave cluster relation? How would you do it at scale? How would you manage MySQL in production? Things that you couldn't potentially put as defaults in the Debian configuration because it might mess with someone else's setup. We had him instill all of his knowledge into the MySQL charm. Now, when MySQL runs, it can be run and configured in multiple different ways to suit your deployment needs. And with all the other services in our charm store, we've talked to the subject matter experts, the people who write the books and say, script how you would do this book and put it in the charm so we can encapsulate a little bit of life cycle around it so we can say how you manage these different events. So why would you want to write a charm? Well, there's a bunch of ways. We, we don't freeze our charm store much like we do. If you're familiar with the Ubuntu archives, their packages get frozen, they kind of get held in time, so one release to another have varying versions. We don't freeze our charm store, so if you want to make a contribution to a charm that exists for a certain series of Ubuntu, you can do so without having to worry about it going through a very rigorous and tedious and time-consuming process for updating packages. The way packages are done are fantastic to ensure stability. We have a very lightweight review process that makes sure that charms will still work for, for people using them. But we don't have that, that sense of a freeze for package acceptance, like you see in the Debian ecosystem. Um, and we give you more flexibility with the package. If you want to grab something from an outside world, let's say your application does a wget from or a clone from GitHub and runs make and make install, and that's how you install your service. There's no other packaged way. With the charm, since you can write it in any language, you can do that. And as a result, you get a bunch of cool and interesting workloads that you can deploy, whether you want to do them for yourself or you can share with others by using uh, namespaces within our charm store. So much like PPAs for Ubuntu, you can have namespace charms that exist outside of the official charm store, but could do some really cool, interesting, bleeding edge stuff that you normally wouldn't be able to do in the sense of a package for Ubuntu or that alleviate the need for people to go read your readme on how to download, make, install, compile, set the sys steps, do all the proper configuration and such. So it gives you an easier way to bring your, your, your cloud, your software that runs in the cloud, on servers, wherever, to your users in that much quicker fashion. Um, so 
Juju also allows you to do some machine level stuff. Let's say you want to orchestrate where your deployment goes. You can tell Juju, oh, this service needs to run on a minimum of eight gigs of RAM, or 32 gigs of RAM and eight CPU. And it'll go and find an equivalent machine in your provider and do that. Um, this is, again, we're shipping with best practices. Um, very important for Charms. Um, so Charms, as I've been talking about configuration, Charms expose a certain level of configuration to the user. It doesn't have to be necessarily a one-to-one. -one. Like, you don't want to expose every single line in my.conf for MySQL or every single possible option in Apache to your user. That's something that you're doing. You're sending an opinionated deployment. So, for instance, the MySQL charm has a tuning level configuration option, which will modify several my.cnf values to represent each of these potential workloads. A fast, a safe, and an unsafe option. Um, where unsafe, for instance, just disables bin log format, goes crazy as fast as it can with no regard to your data, and safe does the best thing possible to maintain a short, maintain your data short of a disk failure. So really you encompass, again, your expertise of the service, your knowledge of the service, and how you think it's best to configure that service, and you expose that to your users. Um, some additional things that Juju provides that makes workloads easier. Um, I'm going to show you uh, my little command line here. Uh, I'm going to run this and hope the internet is going to be responsive for a live demo. Uh, but just before I walked in the room, I ran a quick deployment. Those commands I showed you in the very beginning, Juju uh, Bootstrap, Deploy MySQL, MediaWiki, HAProxy, etc. I ran those against uh, HP Cloud, and we support a number of different providers um, for, for Juju. And at the end of the day, I get to see if you like this, if you like the YAML machine level view of things, if you're a developer like me and GUIs are kind of evil, um, you can do this. You can look to see how many machines you have, their states, their IP addresses, and then you can look at your service topology, much like you did in the GUI earlier. But you can see I have HA proxy. I have the relations here. I have different units. I have a Juju GUI, which is what we saw earlier. I have a MediaWiki, and I also have multiple units of MediaWiki. Zero, one, two. So what this shows is what, what this charm does is it's it's organized everything in service groups and units all inherit the same configuration, the same events, the same life cycles, the same relations across all of those units. So you have a repeatable way to stand up and scale out or scale in a service, and all that's orchestrated through Juju. Um, so these are some additional cool tricks. Juju SSH is a quick way to access the node. For instance, MediaWiki slash zero will give me SSH tunnel into that unit. Uh, Juju status, we just saw for output. And this is another example of a configuration parameter that completely changes the way the charm operates. Um, so if I deploy PHP admin to inspect the database for whatever reason, um, just temporarily set it up if I don't want to go through the command line, I can choose which version of PHP admin to use. By default, it'll install what's in the archive, which is a few releases behind upstream. But I can set this configuration flag, which will then have the charm download the latest version, uninstall the package version, set up the latest from upstream, which is on SourceForge somewhere, and then reconfigure all my configuration options against it. And then at the end of the day, I'll have the same access I had to my MySQL database, I'll have all the tables visible in there, but I'll be running the latest version of software. So we have several charms that expose this level of configuration options. Um, if you're familiar with OpenStack, there are several different releases of OpenStack, and Ubuntu has made a commitment to support every release of, of OpenStack on our LTS, our latest stable releases. <coughs> we actually have the entire OpenStack infrastructure charms. So if you so were inclined, and you had a bunch of bare metal, you could stand up OpenStack, and we've demoed this at various ODSs. In a matter of 15, 20 minutes, I don't know the exact time, I'll get a full OpenStack deployment, something that looks very similar to this. Each one of these charms exposes the level of configuration that you can say, what version of OpenStack do you want? So we've demoed uh, a live upgrade from, I think, either Folsom to Grizzly or Grizzly to Havana in about 10 to 15 minutes on stage where we just said, okay, set the version from here to Havana. And all the units will then get the configuration update that will then reconfigure themselves in a state that they remain online the entire time without losing any data. So charms are really the encapsulation of how would I do that as a normal user, but with the additional love of being able to do it with a couple command line options or from our, our GUI. So we have about 130 something services that are currently charmed and available for deployment in our charm store. And this is just a sampling of the few that we have. Um, 
So things like Node.js, uh, WordPress, MediaWiki, MySQL, Jenkins. Um, if you really want to run Steam servers now that Steam is coming out with Steam OS, um, we have some certain Steam games charm, so you can just deploy game servers at, on the fly. Um, and really do a lot of things within charms with orchestration for services. Um, so the goal of Juju is not to lock yourself into a provider. Uh, yes, you're writing charms which are locked into Juju per se, but if you leverage another configuration management tool, if you leverage your existing configuration management scripts, whether it be Chef, Puppet, Ansible, SaltStack, uh, the whole gambit of them, you can go ahead and use the orchestration across multiple cloud providers. So if one day one cloud provider is more efficient than the other or more cost effective than the other, you can take down and stand up your deployment or stand up your deployment and then switch all your IPs or do something in that, that fashion within Juju because Juju abstracts the, the layer of the bare metal of the provider, of the virtualization, abstracts that away. So really what you're doing is you're taking services and the endpoint you want to stand those services up on. And to that effect, we have OpenStack and OpenStack-like clouds. Um, HP, Cloud, and Rackspace, for example. Uh, Amazon's EC2 on their AWS, their web services. Um, you can deploy straight to bare metal with something called MAS, which is Metal as a Service, which is another uh, Ubuntu canonical product. Um, Windows Azure, if you want to deploy your workloads to Azure, we support Azure as well. Um, and also LXC containers, so if you want to test your deployment on a local laptop, a developer, if you have LXC installed, you can use Juju to drive that as a deployment method. Uh, and then finally, we have manual provisioning, oh no, that's not the way to go. Um, so you have an SSH server somewhere, you can enlist that within Juju, and then Juju can deploy to that. So really any service, any machine you have, Juju can orchestrate and drive um, with the caveat of as long as it has access to it, knows how to talk to it. And that covers about everything, as long as you have SSH access to a machine, Juju can drive that machine. Um, so coming up close to the end, um, if you have any questions about Juju and Charms, ask me now. If you want to see something deployed, we can try deploying stuff and break stuff. Um, please let me know, but that wraps up my introduction to Juju. I do want to briefly say we'll have an entire Juju track at Config Management Camp in Ghent on Monday and Tuesday. If you're still going to be around at their Fostum, please feel free to come down and see us and dive deeper into Charms and Juju and really the back end stuff to it. But I can accept questions now if anyone has them. Yes. Where's the uh, idiot's guide to getting started with uh, HP Cloud? Um, yes, yeah, so if you go to juju.ubuntu.com docs, one of the third or fourth paragraphs down is how to get started with HP Cloud, and that should get you started after you install Juju. Um, that'll probably help you out there. Uh, so you can go to juju.ubuntu.com to see our marketing of Juju. We have jujucharms.com, which is both a sandbox GUI environment as well as our charm store search. So you can drag and drop stuff as I was showing you earlier, um, mock environments, and then you can export them to stand them up later. Uh, and that represents, that's just a mock JavaScript Juju deployment so you can see and experience it. Um, we are on launchpad.net for our code uh, and launchpad.net slash charms, which I didn't include there. Also pound Juju on Freenode. Feel free to drop in and ask questions. App get installed Juju on any Ubuntu uh, desktop, and then we also have an OSX client, which is quite large, but if you brew install Juju on OSX, you'll get it. And we also have a Windows client, so you can deploy and manage services from your Windows environment. Um, and that is it. So I'll accept more questions. Yes? Juju looks pretty strongly coupled with Ubuntu. So that's a fantastic question. Yeah, that's a great question. So. The question was, Juju seems very strongly coupled to Ubuntu. And at the moment, it is quite strongly coupled to Ubuntu. We, we kind of started the development process of, let's do one thing, let's do one thing really well. So let's do service orchestration on something we know really well, which is Ubuntu. Um, so now that we've reached the point where we're fairly confident the product we have is a great way to run service orchestration, our next step is to, orca is to run orchestration on different platforms other than Ubuntu. So over the next month or two, you'll see improvements on cross-platform as well as cross-distro um, deployments within Juju. But that is definitely something that we're very interested in solving with Juju now that we've kind of solved that problem as a whole, service orchestration, in our opinion. But right now, it is very tightly coupled to a release of Ubuntu. Yes? Right, so I guess this is more like um, 
responsiveness of like auto scaling and stuff like that. Juju has no real method of auto scaling. It's something we're also interested in solving, but it's a very complex and potentially expensive, both compute wise and financial wise, if you get it wrong. Um, so what Juju has is it has an API you can drive. Um, so all the commands I do for the command line Juju status, everything from the web interface here, all runs through this, ser ser um, this central orchestration server that's on your cloud environment that exposes the web socket that you can connect to and drive commands. So if you have a monitoring service that's monitoring your deployment, or if you have logic from, from maybe reading traffic data, you can drive auto scaling of up and down of services through Juju's web socket on your own. But we don't have a component inside of Juju yet that solves that. Um, in the front here, yes. yes. Uh, so that's a Juju managed state. So we connect the uh, WordPress with my SQL, right? Mm -hmm. But now I want to move this to a bigger uh, installation or whatever, but I want to keep my state. Is that up to you to manage the database? Or yeah, okay. so at the moment, you'll have to back up the database and migrate it. Um, you can export the state of your deployment anytime by pressing one of these two buttons. Uh, this just downloads a, ram a YAML representation of your deployment. It'll say the services, the relations that are created, but none of the data will go along with it. Um, we're working on various ways to solve the persistent disk issue. So I want to stand up another deployment, but I want to point to an existing disk I have. Um, that's definitely on stuff for roadmap, but right now, if you wanted to migrate, you'd have to do the migration yourself at the moment. Um, yes? Is there a compelling reason for me to use Juju as opposed to Pivotal's Bosch product? I'm not familiar with Pivotal's Posh product, so I couldn't say exactly what it does. Um, very similar to this? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what the constraints of, of languages are for that. I don't know if you can, how you, how you orchestrate an environment. I'd have to look it up, and I could potentially answer you offline um, how, how this would be different. Um, I know just a few key selling points is, again, charms are in any language, and they are very simple to look at. It's essentially a tarball of a bunch of scripts in a hooks directory and a metadata YAML file that exposes what endpoints and relations it knows how to talk to. So each charm exposes a series of these are the interfaces I know how to talk on, and the interfaces are just bi-directional, very lightly typed um, uh, protocols for communication between services, and then Juju does endpoint matching. So when I go and click on something like uh, memcache here, oh, and choose to build a relation, Juju then knows that the only service that can talk to memcache that hasn't already been connected to memcache is the Rails charm, which is running a very simple Rails app. When I connect it here, that'll then fire the series of relation sequences of both nodes to have them start talking to each other on that secure channel. Uh, and the nodes will talk directly to each other, um, and then they'll just exchange key value data, like what host am I? In the case of memcache, it'll send, this is the port and this is the host name where you can set your configuration and talk to memcache. Uh, and it's, in the example of MySQL, MySQL provides uh, a MySQL interface as its name, then other services re can require that. And the, the Loose agreement is that MySQL will send you a username, a password, a database, and the host to connect to and the port to connect to for MySQL, and all that will be configured for you. So MySQL will create the user, all the, all the information, a unique database, and then send that to that service to consume. So that's, that's kind of what these charms are doing when they're creating relations. They're doing everything that's required to provide the information that you'll need to connect to that service's um, service. <coughs> But I don't know what Posh does, so I can't quite say. But I'd be happy to look at it after this and talk to you about it. Um, any other questions? Yes? Um, I understand the core of Juju was originally written in Python, but yes. you migrated to Go. Yes. Can you share anything about the decision behind that and the implications? Sure. I can give you a little bit of a high, uh, an oversight. I work on the Juju ecosystems team, Juju solutions team. So I'm mostly focused on things like charms. Our, our core team works on the core product. Um, so it was originally written in Python, and about a year ago, maybe a little more, we embarked on a rewrite from Python to Golang. Um, we were seeing some issues with concurrency within Python that were causing bottlenecks at very large scale deployments. So we decided to drop Python for Go, which is a compiled language, and remove uh, Zookeeper as our backend and use MongoDB instead. And with that, we were able to get far more performant deployments at scale. So I was really concerned of how far can we scale Juju up into the hundreds of thousands of nodes, and can we accommodate that within Juju itself? We found that Python, with limits of, of, of running on multiple threads, was quite an issue for that at scale. But at lower ends, it was fine. That's really the reason why we went with that route. Um, any further questions? All right, great. All right.
Thank you very much.